everyone. Welcome to this a very exciting session on how to speak AI and how we're transforming the way we think about talent and AI. I'm excited to be here with this panel. We all heard the keynotes about how AI-powered technology is no longer a luxury and it's no longer a topic of debate. AI is here to stay and we're seeing that it's really the backbone of modern organizational transformation. And it's completely changing how we recruit, engage, and ret retain talent. So it's not easy, <laughs> and many of you know that. There is a lot of challenges that companies face with identifying use cases, with thinking about the experience of your employees, the experience of your candidates, with thinking about compliance and regulations that seem to be changing every single day. But we are very lucky today because we are joined by two experts that are far along on their AI journey and embracing AI and thinking about all these things. So we have Jennifer Sharp, who's with Symmetra, and we have Victoria Myers, who's with Amdocs. And we are gonna dive into some questions in a minute, but I just wanna share with you a little bit about the research that we conduct at Aptitude. I'm an analyst, and we do a lot of research on HR technology. And what we found is that every company and every industry is going through some type of transformation whether that's organizational transformation, cultural transformation, you might be going through a merger and acquisition, your company is going through some transformation. And if we look back four years ago during the pandemic, HR was a big part of all of the transformation conversations because HR, and as you know, practitioners were the heroes of all this change. You had to deal with remote work, you had to deal with mental health, you had to deal with retention, you had to have your CEO calling you all the time to help you navigate all of this change. And what we're looking at now four years later is that HR isn't always part of these transformation conversations. Your company's going through change, it's going through transformation. We have to think about how to get HR back into those conversations. And one way that's happening is through a lot of what we're talking about here at this event, AI, talent intelligence, skills. These are the areas that are driving transformation within HR, within your workforce. And what we found is that companies are maturing in their adoption of AI. We hear a lot about how HR is behind in AI, how HR is not as advanced as other parts of the organization. We're seeing actually in the research that we've done, HR has actually matured quite a bit in its adoption of AI, and companies are at very different stages. And what was really interesting to me about this study is we found one in three companies actually said AI makes the process more human. It gives candidates more of a human experience because they're getting consistency, transparency with responses because employees have a way to feel engaged and to feel seen when AI is involved. But with that maturity also comes some concerns too. And we're seeing that companies really have to think about compliance and regulations in a more meaningful way than we probably have before. So you can see here, companies are at very different stages with how they're thinking about compliance, how they're thinking about regulations. Everything from one in four companies thinking about compliance and making that a priority to one in four actually saying that they're not sure how they should be thinking about it. So we are at a very exciting time within HR technology. Transformation is an option if we think about talent intelligence, if we think about skills, if we think about AI, but we have to be able to really make sure we're using the right provider and we're asking the right questions. So we are going to hear now from our experts um, and I'm going to ask um, Victoria and Jen to actually introduce themselves share a little bit about their role within their organizations and talk about how they're using AI. And Victoria, I wanna start with you because you are the global head of talent attraction at Amdocs. And this is a very exciting role within organizations. So I want you to share a little bit about what you're covering within talent attraction. Excellent, thank you. So um, as you said, global head of talent attraction at Amdocs, which is a role that we actually developed um, as part of our whole implementation process, a part of our journey. Um, we developed a team to do proactive sourcing and candidate engagement using the Eightfold CRM. Um, and our team does also employer branding. So this is really a focus on developing candidate pipelines 
have them engaged with the Amdocs brand so that in the future, when there's an opportunity that comes available, they'll be more engaged with us and willing to either apply or uh, hopefully be hired. It is new and different. Um, so we use AI in support of talent acquisition and talent management. We've been able to provide our talent acquisition teams efficiencies in their processes, um, largely being able to identify within our own ATS database of two million candidates, better matching capability to those open roles, uh, improved employee experience when it comes to internal mobility. And then as a company, we also recently had an AI hackathon um, where we had employees build teams and think through additional ways that AI or Gen AI could benefit either us as employees or our customers. Uh, some of those teams came from HR, and so I'm really excited to see which of those ideas will be developed further. I love the hackathon, and I love that the ideas were coming you know, with use cases in HR. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear more too. But Jen, um, how about if you can share a little bit about your role within S Symmetra and then share a little bit about how you're using AI. Yeah, oh, it's great to be here, thank you. I'm Jen Sharp and I head up the leadership development areas including talent acquisition, talent development, and then I've kind of created a side role in the last couple of years around what we call the future of work. And so that really has become a cross collaboration across the organization and I think that's one where we start to see, and I think several of the speakers this morning talking about responsible AI, how are companies using it, and how do we keep innovating while also making sure we're taking in you know, um, ethical considerations on how that has, is all taking place. What's interesting is, um, Victoria and I have had a chance to compare notes. We started our journey around the use case, truly around more of what became um, talent management. And so we were looking to be able to, how do we continue to grow the skills of our employees so Symmetra, just a little bit of background there, we're a financial services organization, um, but while we're in a very highly regulated, highly regulated um, industry, we're actually very innovative. We're small, we're about 2,600 employees. We're really nimble. Um, we have an amazing senior leadership team who is always looking around the corner to say what's next, what's coming. And so being able to be kind of in this space of introducing something that was, when we started implementation just about 18 months ago, was really cutting edge and, and candidly a little scary. And so trying to partner with individuals both inside and outside the organization to be able to move this, this work forward. Um, we were really lucky because while talent acquisition wasn't part of our initial use case and uh, proposal, it's kind of my secret agenda, to be able to modernize. And so it was great to be able to have Eightfold be on the talent management side the vendor that was by far the, the preferred by this cross, you know, cross collaboration team. And then we were able to um, also add in the talent acquisition piece as well, much, much to the delight and maybe the chagrin of uh, Kara, who's our TA leader, so in here in the room. Great, two themes I'm hearing when I hear both of your backgrounds and your roles within your organization are the alignment that you've created internally with other parts of the business through the future of work or even the hackathon. And the other theme is recruitment and retention. They're really two sides of the same coin. You're looking at this very holistically. You're looking at talent holistically. So with that, I'd love to talk a little bit about use cases because what I hear a lot is companies saying, I want to buy AI. We're going to buy AI. And then we don't really hear much about the conversation beyond that point. You've really identified use cases both of you from different perspectives, talent management and talent acquisition, what use cases did you identify and how did you go about that process? Um, Victoria, let's start with you again. Okay. So for us, it started with uh, 2021 and 2022 were huge years of growth for Amdocs. Um, and when that growth really propelled us to look at our processes, our systems, our tools, and try to figure out where can we make efficiencies and improvements. Um, as part of that, we had a vendor come in and give us that external view into, again, our, even our success factors um, system. Um, and then we ran internal projects as well to look at within talent acquisition and sourcing, what are we doing today? What's our vision of the future? What are those gaps? And then through both of those, we were able to make recommendations for both talent intelligence, talent acquisition, and talent management. 
Now, that's also how we developed a talent attraction team. Again, the idea being that um, now that we have this great tool to, uh, to be able to go after the, the candidates that were already in our systems, as well as attracting new talent, um, we built a team that's independent of talent acquisition and open positions. So they are proactively sourcing talent, adding them to the system, engaging with them, uh, again, warming them up to the brand. Great. I mean, the talent attraction function to think about sourcing, recruitment, marketing, but also influencing talent acquisition, too, is becoming a big function within a, a TA organization. Jen, um, can you share a little bit about how you went about the use cases and, you know, what you're using AI now, you know, to support? Yeah. And, you know, time is fluid, isn't it? I just always think of the before the pandemic or after the pandemic. So pre-pandemic, um, I think we had, I had a colleague who no longer works at Symmetra, but she was a really great thought leader in kind of this, in the human capital space. And she had just an amazing, I've been at Symmetra candidly for, I think it's almost eight, I have to think how old my kids are, 18 years. Um, and so she was somebody who I really had a great partnership with. At the time, I think she sat in the innovation team in IT. And we started hearing about this concept of this opportunity marketplace. And that started to come on the scene and it kind of exploded onto the scene, certainly through the pandemic. Um, and there's been some high you know, visibility case studies that have come out of that. So that kind of started us thinking about what, what does that look like for Symmetra? We have a really robust career framework. We built that out, I think, in like 2014, 2015. And so we felt like our foundation was pretty solid. But what we weren't seeing a lot of, or enough of, is individuals moving out of our supporting contributor roles. So that's kind of those entry, more entry level customer service operational roles. And it's like, I just, I, I'm not an artist at all, but I drew this picture of like a, a big chasm and trying to get our supporting contributors to jump over into the individual contributor roles, like analysts and QAs and you know, developer roles. And, and what we were seeing is most of those positions were being filled externally, yet we're investing so heavily in the training of these supporting contributors. Now, our products are super complex, so it takes time to learn. Our systems are even more complex. Um, and so we're investing all of this energy into these supporting contributors, but over time we were just not seeing them or not enough of them making this leap over into the, the ICs, much less into, into manager roles. And so I think that's really, that was sort of the genesis of our early use case around how, how do we even know what skills our employees have? And then how do we start identifying those skill adjacencies? So if I need somebody who's a developer in Python, I might be able to find somebody who is an, an associate developer who doesn't have Python yet, but they have skill adjacency. But literally, we, we had absolutely zero insight into any of that. So that's really where the conversations, I think, started. Um, and predominantly, again, in the kind of the, the talent management space. I'd like to add, uh, as a follow-up, um, for us, it was also about our overall talent strategy of being able to provide to our business units a view into their own organization and their employees and their skills, their capabilities, and their aspirations, and marrying that to the business demands. Now, helping the business to be able to make those informed decisions about, do I need to upskill and train? Do I need to internally mobilize to staff a project? Um, or should we hire? And are we engaging with the talent that's out there? So that was really part of um, our overall strategy as well. Yeah, I love that. It's not just about the pressure to buy AI or this feeling that we should buy, buy AI. It's aligning it with what the priorities are for your talent teams and your overall business and then figuring out you know, where you need that support. And I love the other theme that comes out when I hear both of you talking is that you don't have to do everything. I mean, your vision was broader, but you could start small mm -hmm. and then expand. And I think that's a great way to think about it. Mm -hmm. So the AI landscape has changed quite a bit. There are many providers out there, and we heard that in the keynote presentations this morning. But Jen, I want to ask you a little bit about evaluating providers and navigating this landscape, because there are providers that have genuine AI solutions, and there are providers that do not. How did you go about this process? Well, <laughs> that's a great question, because I think that um, I am very fortunate that I had a, a very, very smart team who asked a ton of questions. And so it is one where it's, you know, when you're going through that process and you're looking at a, a variety of providers, it, you know, kind of all a little bit gets blended in there and it's like, okay, wait, I have to go back and look at that screenshot. Did they have that? And, and so I think the team, what they did a really good job is narrowing in 
and then not um, necessarily taking the answers at face value, but literally kind of like, I want to see under the hood. Show me under the hood, which I think surprised some of the, the folks because um, no offense to sales folks, but that may not be their forte to be able to speak to the, the real technical engineering. And, and we sort of, I'll say, demanded to get the engineers on the call with us so that the, you know, I got to sit back and kind of go, let you guys talk, um, but the really understand what was happening and what, what the technology was built on so that we felt confident in the, you know, to what depth is it? Is it the AI kind of like an add-on? Is it sort of like being bolted onto it? Or is it really part of the, the chassis? Um, and so that was, again, that was not necessarily something that I was going to be able to ask those questions, but I found that people could. Yeah, it's appropriate to ask the tough questions and ask a lot of questions. Yeah. And I think it's easier to do that when you're evaluating than after you've made a decision and you're not happy. So let's talk about everyone's favorite topic within AI, and that's compliance. It's something that not everyone's comfortable talking about or thinking about early on, but it's important. And I want to ask both of you, how important was compliance when you were thinking about your talent strategy and your AI strategy? And what are some best practices that companies can think through? Um, so Jen, can we start with you and then Victoria? Sure. Um, I think what we learned is uh, it wasn't that we didn't have our compliance. We're in insurance financial services, highly regulated. I'm not sure anybody is more regulated than we are. But at the time when we started this journey, the, the AI landscape, I mean, AI wasn't even much of a topic out there. It was sort of this nebulous thing. And I, I would say it was definitely not on the radar for um, our internal partners. So I'll be honest, we kind of started off on the journey a little bit blind to that or sort of like having blinders on to it. Um, I was telling Victoria, it's like, I, I can laugh about it now, um, but we were well into implementation of our talent acquisition last year, and I got an email from our law department, and they said, we need to, to stop, we need to hold off, and I think we were like less than a month out from actually turning it on, and they said, um, in order to do this, we, our guidance is that we have to have the Symmetra privacy policy changed, and I went, I don't think that's going to happen, you know, like, like the Symmetra.com, what people see on our privacy policy. And so if you had said to me six months earlier, hey, Jen, as part of this project, the privacy policy will have to change, be changed, I probably would have thrown in the towel and gone, that's not going to happen. Well, we were already so far into impl implementation that we're like, okay, we're going to make this happen. So I think it is, um, it, this landscape is changing so quickly. And even your internal folks may not have that expertise and, and it's no fault of their own at all. So I think in hindsight, the advice I would give my past self is get somebody engaged who at least has some of that expertise and can maybe point out to you and say, hey, you know what, this has the potential to impact um, your privacy policy or whatever the thing is for your organization. Because <coughs> I think that was a big blind spot for us that suddenly, and in fact, it delayed implementation by about six weeks. Um, if, it, if you want to go up to the symmetra.com privacy policy, you will see a, a lot of uh, the uh, lift and shift from, I think, the eightfold language that they helped us with. So, Well, for us, I would say it was twofold. Um, as a tech company, we also were already looking at um, our own employee base and having AI policy in place. Uh, just for general usage, um, as well as training on that. And then uh, SDLC for our software engineers, a separate policy. So it's very important that we are looking at data privacy of our customers and our customers' customers in, in many instances. But it's also very important for us when it comes to our employee data and candidate data. So when it came to the implementation, um, obviously partnering very strongly with our legal and, and privacy teams, um, which are pretty strict <laughs> in relation, so I can totally relate about policies. Um, so what we actually set up when, uh, and again, talking about that proactive sourcing, proactively adding people to the Eightfold system, to the talent network, um, what we do is a four-part email sequence to let them know that we have their information and we've put them into our database and request that they opt into our privacy statement. If they do not opt in, it's a, over the course of 45 days, we will purge their information. So again, it's all about taking care of what a candidate may would want 
Um, and that's long before we ever start engaging the, with them through our CRM campaigns. That's great. And one theme that comes up when I hear you talk about compliance is partnership. And I think often we don't think that. Compliance feels like it's us against our internal mm -hmm. stakeholders or it's us against our vendor. And you've really worked with your vendor through Eightfold and also internally to build a support system to ensure everyone's on the same page with compliance. It's not a, a battle, it's actually a partnership. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about talent intelligence. That's the theme of the next two days. It's obviously what Eightfold does so well. And to me, there's buying AI and then there's talent intelligence which drives transformation and drives outcomes. So how are you thinking about talent intelligence and how are you use talent, talent intelligence to actually drive organiza organizational outcomes? So Victoria, I know you have a lot to share on the outcome <laughs> side, can you, can you start? Yeah, definitely. So for us, um, you know, again, I had to mention about the strategy uh, of wanting to give a total talent solution to the business units, giving them that view of what's in their business units in relation to the skills of their employees, um, as well as across Amdocs. So that way we can look at, um, have employees been upskilling? Have they actually worked on a project? Or do they need to work on a project in order to really utilize those newly formed skills? Um, then the next phase of that is, what does the external market look like? Um, have we been engaging with that talent? Are they, are they warmed up to us? Or do we potentially want to look at contractors? So all of that is only possible through talent intelligence. And I forgot to add the aspirations of your own, own employees, a very important part with the career interests, um, um, part of the talent management. Um, so this is something that, that you would not be able to do if you just had all of these systems that weren't operating and talking and, and working together. And that's what Eightfold's been able to provide us. That's great. Jen? Yeah, I, I think that um, the overall just giving the control and giving employees that platform to really run with things. And so what we're, we're seeing is, I think, I'm going to get the number wrong, but at least over 80%, I don't know that we're quite to 85% of our employees have gone in and claimed their profile in the career hub. So that right there just tells me that even, you know, I, I'm guessing the ones who probably haven't are like our senior leaders. And, but to see the vastness of our employees really wanting to take ownership of that, to be able to, to have that career navigation, to be able to indicate, you know, what interests do I have, and not to be kind of feeling like they're just stuck in this, this job. Um, I didn't mention uh, Symmetra. We actually made the decision in, in, I think it was 2021. We've always been headquartered in Bellevue, Washington, and we had a couple of, of larger offices throughout the U.S., we actually decided to become a remote first organization. So now you take this population of 2,600 employees who are now distributed across the US and this, I think this platform now is giving us insights that we might not otherwise get with such a distributed workforce. Um, and I think it's really gonna be exciting. You know, I think the next year is going to really, as that, as that information gets into the platform and the, the system just learns about Symmetra specifically, uh, it's going to continue to get smarter. It'll serve up better recommendations for employees about what their their next career path could be um, and how to close those skill gaps. So I just feel like we have insights into our workforce that we've we never, never have had before. I love that. And I know when we've talked before, you're not only getting the insights that benefit your organization, but then all of the employees and eventually candidates too will have an opportunity to be seen and get a fair and inclusive experience as well. Yeah, and I think that's one of the, the things. Um, so it's inter interesting because our vision is for Symmetra that it's about creating a world where more people have access to financial freedom. And then as part of that is we actually have this very lofty aspiration to be the most inclusive insurance carrier in the US. And so it's you know really doubling down on how do we help hiring managers make the best decisions. And I think the, the candidate masking of names is a great starting place. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it really helps kind of inter interrupt some of that unconscious bias that, that happens. Um, they were at first a little like, why can't I see their names? And it's like, just you make your decisions based, fact-based decisions. So I just think that a lot of the um, aspects of the platform and continuing to see how the platform is evolving is really exciting to me. We have other, um, 
tools, I'll say, in our ecosystem that are kind of stagnant, that aren't, you know, making, they, they work, they're doing what they, we expected them to do, but really starting to see Eightfold make the, the leaps and bounds that it is, is, is really exciting. Yeah, benefits to the company and benefits to the individual. Um, Victoria, I know we talked a little bit about how important efficiency is and how important engagement is, and you had some very specific improvements that you've seen across time to source right. and then also with engagement too. I'm hoping you could share those before our last question. Um, so 40% of our, um, a 40% improvement in time to source from prior to implementation, so 2022 to now, it's been a 40% improvement in that time to source metric and a 20% improvement in time to hire. Um, we took for our, our internal mobility from 38% to 48%. Um, which is fantastic. Now we also implemented internal mobility policy changes to make it easier for employees to move internally, um, but we're all about ensuring that our employees have that capability to move. We, we provide the upskilling, everything that, that could help them to really grow their careers. Um, the last metric is going to be really around the, that candidate engagement. Now we don't have the prior numbers because we didn't have a CRM beforehand other than you know, obviously LinkedIn, open rates and things of that nature. Um, but we are averaging, and this is a year's worth of data, 56% um, open rate um, for all of our CRM campaigns a 4% click-through rate, which the marketing benchmark is 2%, so we're above that. Um, we've tracked 40 hires specifically through this channel and 15 just in the last month. So it's been absolutely a game changer for us to be able to have that proactive engagement with our employees. We're talking about alumni, silver medalists, you know, graduates who might have uh, applied five years ago but are still in our system and we're now engaging with them. Uh, it, it's been absolutely amazing. Pulling the whole talent attraction together. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, excellent. So you've both embraced change. You've found a partner. You've asked the tough questions. And I'm hoping you can leave us all with a takeaway, a lesson learned that might help anyone going through this journey too. So Jen, can we start with you? Yeah. Um, I think my first, my first thing was is don't be afraid to push the, the envelope. Um, I think, again, coming from a, a place where we are, we are, as an organization, innovative, but also very risk averse. And so um, there, you know, kind of have to put yourself out there a bit. And it is a really new landscape. And, you know, I think about like our internal law partners, they really rely on, you know, precedent. There is no precedent. And so being able to sort of say, but we don't have anything we can look at to say, where is the risk on this? Um, and so I think really, and, and it's that cross collaboration. We've actually just recently stood up um, and a, I think we're calling ourselves like the AI Working Council. So working across our organization on anything that is AI related. Um, and it's really, it's kind of, um, it's very rewarding after everything we've pushed through to see our talent intelligence platform as kind of one of the um, pinnacles that our organization is, is currently doing in that space. Um, but don't be, don't be afraid to try. Yeah, I think, um I think this is anything in, with any large project. You really have to look at what are your particular goals, set your priorities, especially if there's multiple goals, and then be, uh, be on alert for scope creep. Um, because it's going to be really easy when other individuals in the organization hear about what you're doing and, oh, can it do this? Well, it can, but that's not what we're looking to implement right now. Um, there's a lot in the platform. There's a lot of capability. Um, so I would say just, again, focus on your, your initial goals. And what we ended up doing is phase A uh, and phase B and phase B1 and phase B2. Um, so, you know, because there's so much that we want to accomplish as a company, and we're very driven, um, a lot of tech people within Amdoc, so it's been an amazing journey. Um, but again, we have to make sure we're staying focused on what the original goal and intention was. Great advice. So thank you all for attending. How about a big round of applause for our amazing panelists? Thank you.